Ladies and gentlemen, I'm your host, Drew the Dragon Slayer Thomas, coming to you live, both online and in person, from the Norman Rockwell Museum. The mission of the museum is to illuminate the power of American illustration art and to advance the enduring qualities of kindness, respect, and social equity that's portrayed in Norman Rockwell's art. I'll begin by reading our land acknowledgement. We're thrilled to be, uh, excuse me, it is with gratitude and humility that we acknowledge that we're learning, speaking, and gathering on the ancestral homeland of Mohegan people, who are the indigenous people of this land on which the museum is built. Despite tremendous hardship and being forced from here, today their community resides in the Wisconsin and is known, it resides in Wisconsin and is known as the Stockbridge Muncie community. We pay honor and respect to their ancestors past and present as we commit to building a more inclusive and equitable space for all. So now I'd like to welcome you all to the fourth episode of our Tuesday program, Meet the Artist series, where we'll be in contact with the most talented illustrators and painters of our generation. As well as you all, the audience, both online and person, we encourage to be a part of the conversation as well. For our online audience, we encourage you to ask any questions you have, submit them to chat, at which point they'll be brought up by me and asked to Scott. For our in-person audience, please just make it known that you have where you can ask the question yourself. So today we're thrilled to be talking with Scott Gustafson. Scott will speak about his life starting with his influences and early approaches to animation, illustration, and art school. He'll talk about early career and his work on classics such as Peter Pan, The Night Before Christmas, and The Night Before Christmas. And then he'll speak about his writing and illustrating illustration. Finally, he'll speak about his process. We're grouping these questions by theme, so we invite you to ask relevant questions as he shares about each topic, and at the end of each topic, we'll open the floor for additional questions. So now I'd like to introduce Stephanie Habush Plunkett, the Deputy, uh, the Deputy Director and Chief Creator. Thank you, um, whether you are here in the room with us or you're online, um, it's a great pleasure to have you with us. And thank you for, to our wonderful staff and interns for making all of this possible. Um, it's really a, a great pleasure to have Scott Gustafson with us today. And I'll just share a little bit of background on Scott, incredibly talented, has a wonderful background, beautiful painting behind him. Um, and I'll uh, as you may know, is one of the amazing artists who are featured in our current exhibition, which is called Enchanted, A History of Fantasy Illustration. So this exhibition will actually be on view through October 31st, in case you're not here and are able to get here. For those of you who have seen it, I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, following its uh, installation here at the Norman Rockwell Museum, it will travel to the Hunter Museum of American Art in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And it will also go to the Flint Museum in Michigan. So we're excited that it will continue on. But to give you a little background on Scott, uh, throughout his prolific illustration career, Scott has worked on many projects, but his great pleasure comes in creating illustrated books inspired by classics. These have included Peter Pan, Red Riding Hood, Snow White, Sleeping Beauty, The Lion and the Mouse, Jack and the Beanstalk, The Emperor's New Clothes, and many more. His unique interpretations of fantasy characters, a life, um, favorite nursery stories, nursery rhymes, which have been passed down through generations, such as Humpty Dumpty, Little Miss Muppet, Three Blind Mice, Little Red Hen, and many that you're probably familiar with. Scott has also found inspiration in the great works of literature like The Wizard of Oz, Sherlock Holmes, and Alice in Wonderland. In fact, his wonderful Mad Hatter's Tea Party is a favorite in our galleries right now. The recipient of many professional honors for his work, Scott is also the author and illustrator of Eddie, The Last Youth, The Lost Youth of Edgar Allan Poe, and has recently released classic storybook um, fables, 
which features almost 50 new paintings for this book. Uh, I want to thank also uh, certainly Scott for being here, but his wife Patty, who was a great assistant to us, and his son um, Carl, who's there in the background, who you don't see, but also assisting hey, with the program. It's, weird. <laughs> it's a great family affair. So um, welcome, Scott, and we so look forward to hearing about your work and maybe getting started with having you talk about um, how you got into the field and who some of your inspirations have been. All right. Well, thank you. First of all, thank you, Stephanie. Uh, it's a great honor to be included in, in this show and be invited to share my work with you here today. Hello to everyone in Stockbridge and to everyone out there in cyberspace. So thanks again for joining us. And I'll start with showing uh, some of my slides or my images. Um, that, of course, is me, uh, old and new. <laughs> But what uh, I thought I'd start with some of my earliest influences, which were Bugs Bunny, things I saw on TV as a little kid. I loved cartoons of any kind. Uh, Bugs Bunny was a particular favorite, but I didn't stop there. It was all sorts of things. I loved Dr. Seuss. I thought it was, I think he was probably one of the first illustrators that I became aware of as an individual. His style was so unique and so recognizable. And he was right there from the beginning, you know, learning to read with one fish, two fish, all that. So it was somebody who was really part of my life, at least early on, and be, made me aware of books as, a, as an art form, I guess. Then there's a picture of Robin Hood, Errol Flynn as Robin Hood. That, that not, only, not only represents that movie, which is one of my favorites, but also films in general. I'm, I'm a film fan. Movies from that period, from the Hollywood golden age are particularly fond, uh, things that I'm fond of. So I think these things kind of were kind of the beginnings of my interest in, in the arts. When I was in eighth grade, uh, the summer before I went to high school, Pinocchio was re-released. And in those days, Disney films were re-released every seven years. So it was time for this to be released. And I, went, uh, even though I was in junior high, I asked a friend to go with me and he thought it was kind of a joke, but we went. I don't, I'm not sure why exactly I wanted to go. I hadn't seen a, a Disney film in the theater since I was a kid or a younger kid. And um, when I saw this, I was really knocked out. There was there's so much depth and beauty in this film. And it's got a range from a lot of humor to the darker moments, particularly the scene where Pinocchio and lamp would turn into donkeys, I think is a, a great scene. And it still, it not only set me on the course to thinking I was gonna be an illustrator, but gave me a new appreciation for all the different types of artists that are involved in making an animated film. Also that same summer, I found these two books in a bookstore and they made equally as big an impression on me as, as uh, the film did. Um, I had seen this, the Norman Rockwell illustrator in the local library, but didn't really have a chance to go through it thoroughly until I owned it myself. And what was significant about that was that it, he has a step-by-step -step in there about basically taking a uh, concept all the way through to uh, showing it to the client, painting it, all his steps, and then delivering it to the client. So it was really a great kind of a foundation for someone who was just curious about the field and wondered at what went into it. There's another artist that became an in influence and a favorite of mine at the same time, N.C. Wyeth. Uh, you're probably a lot of you familiar with his work, but I hadn't seen his work up until the time I was about 14 or 15. And uh, when I came across an article about him in a magazine, I just thought, wow, that's, that is the way adventure stories and classic illustration should look. Uh, I, just, uh, I'm still amazed at uh, any time I get a chance to to go to the the uh, museum in, in uh, Pennsylvania. I think it's a great opportunity. So here's my attempt <laughs> at trying to work out some of the things I saw and and why it's work, and also work in some of my love for old movies. So that's kind of Errol Flynn. Um, I was trying to do an acrylics, which is what this is on a canvas panel. I was working in acrylics, trying to do what Wyeth was doing in oils. And uh, I soon found that 
Uh, you can't always do that. At least I couldn't at that age. Uh, I'm about 15 when I'm doing these. I just am curious, um, Scott, I, I wonder if I could just ask a question. Sure. So these are wonderful, youthful works. Did you have some early art training uh, or was it kind of high school art classes or how, how did you learn to draw? Were you just always drawing? I was always drawing. I should have mentioned that. It was just a big part of how I passed my time. And I, I loved drawing. I would, uh, you know, my brother was a little older than me. So while he was at school when I was, before I was old enough to go to kindergarten, I would pass time just drawing. And uh, so it was always part of what I did to amuse myself. And, uh, and I didn't really have outside training. Art school, I uh, had good teachers when I was in grade school and arts and in high school. And then, so this is at the high school age. I was just spending a lot of my own free time doing it. And I think that's probably where you do the bulk of your learning is um, experimenting and trying things for yourself. Um, but this is my attempt at trying to do rock well. Mm -hmm. I did a lot of these types of things. What I liked about them is that you didn't have to worry about the background. <laughs> I, I was just primarily interested in characters and the immediate furnishings that they were interacting with. So backgrounds were too much for me. Um, mm -hmm. This is my first, one of my first oil paintings. I had been given, my brother and I had been given a set of oils when we were really too young to know what to do with them. And the aunt of ours was very nice to give them to us. But we were considering how long it takes for oils to dry. It was a little bit too much for a seven and a nine year old. So I, we had put those away and I got them out when I was in high school and started experimenting. And I found that I had kind of a feel for it and it felt comfortable. I had to get used to the amount of time it took for them to dry, but I felt comfortable in the way they were handled and using them to blend colors. You know, you have a lot of time to blend the colors. Acrylics, things dry very quickly. You have to move along very quickly or work wet on dry. But with oils, you have time to blend the paint. Then I went off to art school. And there, I thought for sure that I was going to be an animator all the time leading up to high school. I, or leading up to art school, all through high school, I was just bound and determined I was going to be an animator. But I did take other classes, illustration classes, and children's book illustration was one of those. And for some reason, up until I took that class, I hadn't really thought of it as a possible career choice. But I found that there were aspects to illustrating children's books that really appealed to me. So I was kind of back to trying to decide, well, what am I going to do, animation or illustration? This is a pen and ink. It was just, I, like to use a lot of textures, so I tried to work those in. Uh, now, while I was in school, a friend of mine was a little bit older, got out, and he was had gotten a job in a company that did slides uh, for a living. I mean, for that was their job. They did backup slides for speeches and things like that. And um, anyway, they they had a job in house where they needed. They were going to be doing a safety film strip for the workplace and that on the right that's what that is it's um, i didn't know anything about doing that kind of work but he remembered that i like to draw and he called me in on that and i ended up working quite a bit over the next couple of years for that company but the main thing i learned there was there are deadlines and they're hard and fast <laughs> and you have to learn to work within them and you have to learn to adapt what you're doing to the amount of time you have to do it in. So that was a- uh, what, If I could just ask, what art school did you attend? Oh, I'm sorry. I went to the Chicago Academy of Fine Art. In, Chicago Academy. Yeah, it's no longer in business. <laughs> it went out oh. of business while I was there. So um, it, it was kind of a, uh, I don't know if that was a bad omen or not, but uh, <laughs> you know, leaving there and, and transferring to another school in Chicago, the uh, Columbia College and mm -hmm. um, ended up taking more classes there. Scott, I think um, we do have a couple of good questions, I think, especially as we start talking about art school. Somebody asked from the online audience, was your family supportive of your interest in being an illustrator? 
Yeah, my, my family was always supportive. Uh, they, I think coming from a small town, which I did, I grew up in Ringo, Illinois, which is a small town of about 4,000 people in Northern Illinois. Um, knowing even the idea that you could be an illustrator, an artist for a living was kind of a, it was like saying, oh, I'm gonna be a movie star. You know, you can't, <laughs> there wasn't, we didn't know many professional artists. So it was kind of a stretch to think that the local, their son was gonna go off and be an artist, but they knew I was pretty devoted to the whole idea. And I didn't have a second choice. It was either I was gonna be involved in the arts or, you know, I didn't know what I was gonna do. Uh, I was kind mm -hmm. of single-minded. Thank you. And while we're talking about art school, another good question was, were there any other students at art school who you remember working with and who turned art into a career? Yeah, there were just a few. It's funny how many, at least at the school I went to, how many people didn't end up going on to the field. But a good friend of mine, even to this day that I met in art school is Gary Gianni. And he's got three pieces in the show there at Stockbridge as well. I understand he's going to be doing one of these talks in a week or two. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, Gary was a, a great, is a great friend and a really talented student at that time as well. So, Thank you. Yep. Uh, any more questions? Uh, we're okay for now. Okay. So this other image on this <coughs> uh, page was one of my first chances to do what was passing for animation in Chicago. And that was, this was a special effect for the opening and closing and uh, the Super Bowl that year. I was working with a company that did a lot of commercials. And uh, our job as animators was to outline those photographs. And then we, we did that with black ink on acetate. And then they photographed it and through a photographic process, added that glow. And having that be kind of the extent of, well, that, yeah, this is animation. You want to do this? I was like, well, that wasn't quite what I had in mind when I thought I was going to be an animator. And since I was in Chicago, uh, I thought maybe I'd start looking a little more seriously at illustration. So I did what was called the self-promotion piece. That was kind of what you did then. You'd make an appointment with an art director and you would give them your business card and also a self-promotion piece. We also called them leave behinds. Most of us did them in black and white because that was the affordable way to reproduce them. We didn't have desktops and, and couldn't print out things like we can now. But um, this was a, I decided I'm gonna show people, my prospective clients, what I enjoy doing and how I would handle it if they gave me a cow to draw or whatever. Not that I could handle every or show everything possible in one picture, but I thought it was an opportunity to um, show my approach to things and what I was really passionate about. And I think it helped. I ended up getting work from magazines uh, in Chicago. Uh, also picked up some of my first children's book illustration work. And most of the illustration jobs uh, of people that were doing publishing for kids here in Chicago, it was supplemental things. They weren't really trade books. They were available to libraries and to schools to supplement. They were kind of part of the educational process. So none of the, you couldn't go in a store and really buy these, but it was a good, really good opportunity to learn about pacing and what goes into doing a 32 page uh, picture book and that sort of thing. Um, so those were good experiences. I always also started picking up magazine work. And this was for a magazine called Video Action. And uh, this is acrylic. I was um, always like, at that time, like to caricature my characters quite a bit. Um, but fortunately for me, this illustration, well, it wasn't this one in particular, but the art directors from the two magazines, Playboy and Video Action, were friends and they were talking about local illustrators. And the guy from Playboy said, you know anybody that can do Rockwell? And he said, yeah, actually, there was a kid in here the other day who's doing some stuff for us. So they sent, I went over this interview at Playboy 
and started getting work there. And that was a significant step because Playboy at the time was a very significant, uh, influential magazine. And it was in Chicago. Most of them were in New York, the bigger publications. So getting my work into that got it in front of a lot more people. Uh, this was also a time when I started using photographic reference more effectively and more um, on an average. I mean, I, I, prior to this, I would fake a lot of things, we call it, just kind of draw it from memory or try to make it work or pick it up from existing books or something. But at this point, I started relying on doing my own homework and getting models and uh, doing the reference, finding the objects that I wanted to paint and probably photographing them so that I could use that as reference. Scott, uh, there's a perfect question, um, but I also just wanted to tell you that Gary Gianni is watching right now. All right, so that's just a fun comment. All right. Yeah. I know you, um, you did just show an acrylic and, and somebody asked from our online audience, what medium do you prefer most to paint with now? Are acrylics still part of your work? Uh, not as much as they were. For, for a while, I loved acrylics I, because I had tight deadlines. Uh, it was great to be able to uh, paint, have a painting done and deliver it that same day if you had to. With oils, you have more time. It needs more time to dry. But as my work progressed and I got more um, involved jobs, there was more time for it to dry. Also, there are things that you can add to the paint to uh, speed up the drying time. I use a product that's called Liquin, L-I-Q-U-I-N, and that helps speed up the drying time so that maybe in 12 to 24 hours, the paint will be dry, which helps a lot. Any other Thank questions? You. Oh yeah, um, somebody also asked, how large are your pieces? Uh, they vary. Uh, the one that's behind me right now is about 26 by 32, I think, something like that. Uh, mm -hmm. These paintings, the paintings here that you're seeing here are probably about 18 by 24, 20 by 24, something like that. So they're all kind of sizes in between. Some are a little bigger. I, I don't usually work too much bigger than that largest size that I just mentioned, but on occasion. Uh -huh. Thank you. Uh, this question might lead us back into what we were talking about. Uh, they ask, how did you find models for your work? That's just a matter of trying to remember uh, faces of people that I know or friends. Sometimes I'll call a friend and say, you don't know anybody that looks like this or that, do you? But um, in this, for example, the, the man as the father on the right or on the left here was uh, married to somebody I'd gone to art school with, and he was a young businessman and he it was great because when I called him he was like oh yeah what do you want me to wear uh, Brooks Brothers suit um, you know so he was all ready to help with you know outfitting his character and then the boy mm -hmm. was a, a neighbor boy so it's <coughs> things like that um, you just kind of rely on the people you know I have hired professional models occasionally um, but for the most part it's and and my friends and family uh, Gary <laughs> Gary Gianni has posed quite a bit um, and my wife and son have posed. So you, you kind of get everybody involved. Okay. Well, thank you. I think we're okay for now to keep going. Okay. So what was uh, cool about that, that Playboy job and other jobs for Playboy, it actually got seen by people at the Saturday Evening Post. Now, this wasn't the, the same post that Rockwell was or it had been sold to another company. Curtis Publishing had been sold, I think sometime in the 70s, I'm not sure when, but when they called me, this was about 1982, they were in Indianapolis and they were owned by a different family. Um, but they had seen the work and said, you know, we're looking for a Rockwell person. <laughs> we're always looking for a Rockwell person. And so I saw, I thought that, that sounded kind of cool. So I went, to Indianapolis, met with them and got a call a little later. And they said, well, we've got, we're working on our Christmas issue and we might need cover, but here's the thing. We've got another illustrator working on the cover, a cover concept as well. And we're gonna have you both working and whichever one we like best, we'll use on the cover. 
And the other one will just make use of somewhere within the magazine. So I went to work on this. I'd shown them sketches. They chose this idea. And I kind of kept telling myself, ah, it's not going to be on the cover. I, I felt like I would overwhelm myself if I really thought long and hard about that possibility. But I finished the painting on time, got it in, and what do you know, it became Saturday Evening Post cover. I ended up doing two or three more for them. Uh, but this was the biggest kick, was to actually see my work surrounded by that logo and on that cover uh, where my heroes had been. So that was uh, yeah, that very was exciting, Scott. Um, I wonder if, if you had you become familiar with Rockwell through the covers of the post, or was it more through, you know, residual materials like books and calendars? It was the books. I think he might have been doing some look magazine work when I was a kid. We didn't have a subscription to that magazine, so I only see it occasionally. But yeah, it was. I, and he was a household name. I mean, people would say, oh, that look, he looks like a Rockwell boy, you know, whatever. Um, so I was aware of him and every once in a while I would see something of his, but it wasn't until I saw those books that I appreciated the amount of work that he did. And I started acquainting myself with just how much there was. So it wasn't actually through the magazine that I became aware of it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And that, that, those post covers were seen by a publisher in New York who was ready to, they were in the process of illustrating classic stories, children's classics, and they wondered if I would be interested in Pinocchio. And of course I was, but I wanted to make sure that I didn't uh, do something that where I was just imitating the film because as I said, that had been such a big influence. So I read it, I had read it, and it's a strange, episodic book. A lot of things happen. Pinocchio's a pretty naughty little boy most of the time, but there are a lot of interesting characters and a lot of cool situations that are fun to illustrate. So I got started on that. I did, I think, about five pieces, and they said, you know what? Uh, we want to go back to Pinocchio, but we think that it might be better for your, you and introducing you to children's books that we start you with something more well-known, something like The Night Before Christmas. And I thought, okay, well, that sounds good to me. I always liked Santa Claus. So started work on that. And um, in about six months, had to complete the whole book, which was a pretty tight deadline for me. Uh, it was also the first time that I completely <coughs> a project from end to beginning to end in oils. Uh, so that was a big learning experience. But I enjoyed the process and I enjoyed um, being able to lay out a whole book. What I was finding was now that I wasn't thinking about being an animator uh, and thinking more about an illustrator, I was more, I think I was more attuned to that lifestyle or that career choice because I, I was interested in the whole picture as opposed to just one character moving through a scene. I, I liked art directing and directing and trying to figure out what camera angle I was going to use and what scene I was going to portray. So it was probably a better fit for me in the long run to go into illustration. Scott, um, excuse me, somebody from the audience asked, how long does it take you to illustrate an entire book? Well, this one, usually they take as long as you're allowed to take. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I end up, uh, this one, like I said, I had about six months and that was really tight. I wasn't married at the time. I didn't have a family. And so I was working seven days a week. Um, so it just depends. The last two books, several books that I've done, they've probably taken from a year, two years, a year and a half to two years, and they have about 50 paintings in them. So I'm pretty slow in the illustration world. Uh, a lot of people could work faster than I do, but for me, that's about what it can take. Um, any more questions? I can... No, thank you. I just want to remind the in-person audience, just feel free to flag me down at any time and you can ask yeah. any question you want. Anybody have a question in our audience right now? Okay. Thank you. We're all so, set. Okay. So this, <laughs> after I'd finished this, what was released, 
they said, well, we know we started Pinocchio, but how would you like to, we've got a big project we thought you might be right for. We want to do The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. And I thought, wow, I've read The Hobbit, but I hadn't read The Lord of the Rings. I knew people were, I, I liked, I loved the story, but I just wasn't that familiar with the whole story. I had a friend who was a big fan of it when I was in high school, so I picked up a lot through him. But the other thing was they sat down and said, okay, based on how long it took you to do the paintings for the night before Christmas, we think doing these four books, probably about two years per book. So let's say eight years from beginning to end for the whole project. And that was pretty daunting. Uh, when you're about 25 years old or whatever I was, to think that, boy, I won't finish this until I'm in my mid thirties. Um, it, it was a lot to think about. So they said, how about this? You look, you read the books, see if you like them, uh, if you're interested in committing to them. And then you do some paintings. This happened to be in the spring. And they said, take the summer to do that. And we'll talk to you at the end of the summer. So I started work. I did, actually, this is one of the later pieces that I did, but I did four or five pieces before this. This is that night, um, I think it's called Dark for Dark Business. Uh, when all the dwarves show up and tell Bilbo that he's bound for an adventure. Um, but anyway, so this is the drawing. This is a charcoal drawing. Uh, I don't work quite this way anymore, but this is all on one piece of paper. And uh, this is what it looked like in color. This ended up being a very involved time consuming piece for me. And I ran into a lot of technical problems. And um, I, but I finished it and sent it off and the art director called and said, well, you know, we like it, uh, what next? I said, well, I'm glad you like it, but I'm not doing the book or I'm not doing the books. Uh, mm -hmm. I just, I realized in the process that I, I probably wouldn't be able to keep to that schedule. And that if any of the other paintings were like this one, I was gonna kill myself before I was done. So <laughs> as much as I didn't like the idea of turning down that possibility of doing it, I decided that it wasn't right for me, at least at that point in time. And once I made up my mind, I actually haven't ever regretted it because it was, they decided to try their hand with another illustrator and that didn't work out because they didn't, the guys I was working for didn't have permission to do the book. They were only doing this kind of hoping that they could. It never worked out. And as it turned out, I wouldn't have, uh, I would have been stuck with a probably a year's worth of work without having to publish. So I was I, curious about something, um, just from a process perspective in the last piece, because it's such a beautiful piece. What were some of the um, technical challenges that you referred to that well, made this? I, I made a mistake in that I tried a new, this is getting really technical, but I tried using a different type of gesso on the canvas before I started. And it had a very weird effect on the paint. It, it, uh, as you can see, it reflects a lot of light and it's catching in the darker areas, it's catching the light in a strange way. And I had to fight that the whole time through. I would have not, I never did another painting on that type of gesso again, uh, but also just the amount of, of work, um, the technical work that went into choreographing this many people in a scene uh, and the lighting and all that and, and arranging for models and everything. Um, plus, there are a lot, there's a lot that goes on in that book, and I knew that I might not be up to the task, at least at that point in my career. <laughs> of handling all the, the challenges that were ahead in that particular project. Thank you. Scott, there, there's another question kind of along the same lines. They ask, for your storybook illustrations, did you continue to use models and stand-ins or did you try out a new way of painting slash setting up your scene? Um, I've always, well, it depends on the subject matter. I've done I did a counting book and an alphabet book, which are primarily all animal characters, and I didn't use any models for that. Uh, but I rely on finding reference on the on the animals and then, you know, drawing them uh, in a way that I can 
for uh, combine the reference that I find with the poses that I need. Um, but for the most part, when it comes to doing realistic renditions of human beings, I almost always have a model. I just find it, you save yourself a lot of trouble that way because there are so many subtle things that happen on a face and with human hands and uh, mm -hmm. you know poses that you, I at least really need to rely on reference to, uh, to just save me the, heart, the heartache of <laughs> trying to figure it out from my memory. So say for the uh, illustration that you just showed us, would you have, with all those characters, would you have uh, models for that or? Yeah, I had models, but hardly any of them looked that way. Um, the guy by the, with the violin by the fireplace, that was actually my animation teacher. Uh, mm -hmm. the, guy, awesome. the guy who's Bilbo looking up at him sitting at the stool, he was an art director for an animation company. Uh, but he, he, he was going to be my Bilbo if I went ahead with it. And then Gandalf over here on the right, that was actually a guy, an old guy that Gary met, uh, who lived in his neighborhood. His name was Skip Manley. He, he'd been a rigger with the circus. Uh, but he was a real character, and he had a long beard, and he became my Santa Claus for a while, and he was going to be Gandalf. So the, the rest of those faces were based on uh, maybe old movie photos. Uh, actually, the guy standing in front of the window, that was a good friend of mine too, Jim Robinson. So that one looks kind of like him, but everybody else is kind of a, an added face, an adapted face, I should say. That's very interesting, thank you. Um, before we move on, I did have, want to ask another kind of process question. They ask, in recent years, uh, when you illustrate, do you send the company the finished piece? or do you take photos or scan the piece? And how do you do that with something that size? In the old days, you had to send it all in. Um, so you might wait to do a, a group and then send those, but eventually the art went to the publisher and they, they shot it, had it shot, and then did their, their technical stuff from there. But now we have things done locally. We have a photographer that we work with I don't think he scans it. He puts it on, on a uh, bed and shoots, physically shoots it uh, because scans don't quite work on oil paintings. At least for us, they don't. Um, but yeah, so we can send the file now to the client as opposed to having to send the original artwork. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So when I turned down the, uh, Hobbit, they said, how would you like to do Peter Pan? And I thought, that sounds great. I hadn't read it, <laughs> only seen movie versions, but I love the book. And there was a lot in there that was to my liking. There, there are pirates and Indians and mermaids and uh, little kids uh, you know, living on their own in the woods. <laughs> so there was a lot there that I thought I could have fun with. Uh, the problem was that I got back into doing these involved scenes and I ran over, I think it was supposed to take about a year and a half to two and ended up taking three years. So it, uh, it was a real learning experience. Uh, it was good, uh, uh, a good experience and I learned a lot doing it, but it gave me a little more uh, pause as far as like, okay, so what can I take on in a given amount of time? Uh, what can I realistically expect to do? So that was, um, and also there was a glitch. Uh, while I was working with changed publishers just as I finished the book and it didn't get published for several years after I finished it. So there for a while I thought, if I have to work this hard and not see my work published, I might not stick with this children's book illustration racket. <laughs> I might have to find another way to make a living. Uh, here's another painting, this big fight scene with, uh, Peter Pan and Captain Hook. I thought Captain Hook would have been played beautifully by Basil Rathbone, who's also in the Robin Hood that I showed you. He's a uh, uh, guy of his born, but he was a great English actor in Hollywood during the 30s and 40s. And I thought he would have made a great Captain Hook, so that's who I made Captain Hook look like. 
Oh, this is a great uh, place to ask this question. Uh, somebody asked, do you feel as though the movies of these stories influenced your illustrations at all? Um, I try to say with the, the only one I'm really familiar with, there's a silent version, at least when I was working on mine, there was an old silent version and then there was the, the Disney version. And mm -hmm. I just thought by the way that I was, I, want, I don't want to be overtly influenced. You can't help but be. But because they made a film and they adapted it to be a film, um, sticking to the book is sometimes difference enough. You know, if you, if you just stick to the text, uh, chances are you're not going to run into too many places where you're um, overlapping what exactly happened in the movie. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to distract you, but we've had this question for a while. They just asked, what is your favorite piece and what have you done so far? Oh, that you have done so far. Uh, that's a hard one. I, I think I'll opt for uh, Picasso's answer. Uh, I thought he had a good answer for that question. What's your, what's your favorite piece? I said, and he said, my next one. So, and that's uh, what Rockwell <laughs> used to say too. Rockwell used that one too. Okay, oh my God. well, it's handy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. So I also did, uh, after that I started, I was asked to do a cover for uh, uh, Treasury of Children's Literature. This one is still available in the stores. It's about 30 years old, but the book's been in print for that long. And uh, I saw it as an opportunity, pretended that I was designing a mural for a children's uh, library or something. And the idea was to get as many of the characters on the cover as might be inside the book. Uh, so this was a lot of fun to do. I really enjoyed this piece. Then I uh, actually sought out doing limited edition prints. This was the early 90s. <clears throat> and limited edition prints were becoming a very popular thing. And it appealed to me that because it seemed like you could pick your subject matter. And excuse me, I have to drink. You could pick your subject matter and you probably had a better time uh, frame to work on uh, and doing paintings that would eventually sell, hopefully, to people that wanted to collect the prints. Mm -hmm. um, actually, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. Prior, at the same time, I started working for a company called the Bradford Exchange, and they were doing limited uh, edition plates, ceramic plates, and they were very popular, and they always had ads in women's magazines and Sunday supplements, but they were nearby in Chicago, uh, in a suburb here. And uh, they had seen the night before Christmas and wondered if I was interested in working with them. So I went out and they were actually on the verge of doing a series of either nursery rhymes or fairy tales. I said, both of those would appeal to me. I did a painting, a nursery rhyme, and then I did this Goldilocks picture. They did what was called uh, focus test testing. So they would, test images at, you know, with groups of people and see what the best responses were to the images. This, fortunately for me, this image tested fairly, and got a, a strong reception, and they decided to do what they call a full rollout and start a series and see how many plates we could do. I ended up doing eight altogether, but these ads were showing up and it got seen by quite a few people. So the challenge in doing these was you had to design them for a circle. I knew that I would eventually want to use them for other purposes. So I designed them for rectangles as well. But I, when I go out to their offices, there were a lot of artists that only worked in the circle. And um, that was an easier way to do it and faster probably, but I thought you were probably limited in how you could use the artwork after that. So this was Goldilocks and like I said, it was the first one. Um, it also, uh, this was also my first um, nursery rhyme piece for them, Humpty Dumpty. What was fun about this was that I tried to work in a secondary story, so you probably can't see it there, but there's a, a little yellow bird just above Humpty Dumpty there in the tree, and the cat is watching the bird, and the dog is watching Humpty, and if one of those animals moves quickly, I think history is about to be made. So. 
Scott, these are really wonderful. And that's a, this is another area that you have of overlap with Rockwell because you probably know Bradford Exchange was also producing um, you know, a fairly extensive series of Rockwell collector plates as yeah, well. I, I think they went back to the archives and to the Rockwell family many times because they had such success with Rockwell and his images that they kept thinking, well, we'll, we'll finish that Rockwell series and then there'd be such demand they go back and find more images and do more. Right. Yeah. yeah. Scott, I also think this, we have kind of a fun question here. Um, they ask, as a child, what was your favorite fantasy story and did you ever attempt to create a painting for it? Um, I think I was, uh, it's hard to say. I mean, I did, I watched a lot of cartoons and I would draw situations with characters like the ones I saw. I didn't really try to draw Bugs Bunny or Mickey Mouse or anything, but I would come up with situations where I would use them. I can't remember that there was one story that really caught my eye or my imagination that much. It was more kind of group mm -hmm. stories. Yeah. Uh, All right. Okay. So the image that's up here is you might recognize from the show. That was also a, a collector's plate. And it also, there, this was another one in the series too, the caterpillar, advice from the caterpillar. So those, I think I did four, four pieces that were eventually plates uh, for the Bradford Exchange. Then now is the time when I actually started looking to do limited edition prints. And I approached a company in Connecticut called the Greenwich Workshop. And they were interested in working together. They were able Sorry, to- Sorry, could you uh, share your screen? Have you shared it? Oh, did there you not see that? Yes, we can see it. Oh, okay, okay. Um, yeah, so this is uh, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. And what I loved about doing a print with them was there was no, I didn't have to keep it in a circle. I could make it a rectangle uh, wide or high or whatever. And I was aching to get out of uh, the circular square format. So I took the opportunity to do the, uh, this double page spread basically. And all seven dwarves are in there. This turns out that I'm, I'm the uh, dwarf holding the flowers. My uncle is at the wood box. My dad is lighting the lamp. And then there's another friend of the family who's not related, another illustrator named Glenn Gustafson. He's several, he's the guy in the back room uh, as well as some of the other guys. So I like to call this a Snow White and the Seven Gustafsons. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, while I was working at Greenwich, they also wanted to do a, a series of porcelains and uh, figurines. And we ended up doing fairy tale things, but because of the process of doing porcelains, I had to design them and, and draw them from different angles, but I also had to do a color study for the painting when the thing was finally finished. And I thought I would use that opportunity to do vignettes for the book that I hope to do someday. So I hadn't, I didn't have a, a definite time for when the book was gonna happen. I just knew that if I could, if I was doing related things to these fairy tales, I kept the characters the same and uh, tried to put them in formats that I knew I could use in the book. And eventually there in the upper left, is a fairy tale book that did come out of a lot of those first images. Then I also did, uh, as you can see, there was a nursery rhyme book, bedtime stories, and then the most recent one was the fables. I'm so sorry, Scott. Um, I should have asked this earlier. Uh, for the illustration a few uh, slides ago, they asked, how do you get reference for this kind of furniture? That, or probably that, just like furniture, you know. Yeah, the, the furniture, that's uh, mostly books on antiques um, almost exclusively. Uh, just, I have different periods and go to the library. I've come home with stacks of library books. Now it's a lot easier. You can go online and look up periods and scan through a lot or skim through a lot of things. But yeah, it's, it's a lot of just research. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I just, we might not get another chance to ask. Somebody asked, do you get paid when you get hired, when you deliver the work or when it's published? Um, 
it depends. A magazines, it could depend. It de a lot of times they didn't pay until after publication. So if you were doing something three months in advance, you had to wait a while for that paycheck. With children's books, usually you get an advance and they might break that into two payments. They might say, okay, we'll pay you. Uh, it's an advance against royalties. So they'll pay you half at the beginning and then half upon completion. So it's making those advanced dollars uh, last a long time <laughs> when you only get half at the beginning. Sometimes mm -hmm. you can talk them into breaking it into a couple of different payments so that you maybe get a quarter of it at a time so you're not waiting for a big hunk of money at the very end. But that's primarily how it goes. Thank you. Um, somebody else asked, how did you retain the rights to use the artwork for other projects when it was commissioned? Um, I learned through experience that that's, uh, as an artist, as an illustrator, your creation is your property unless you've agreed to uh, either share or sell the copyright. If you're working for somebody like Marvel or Disney, that's, that doesn't apply. You agree that you're working on established characters and, and that those are their property. But when you're doing books like this, you automatically, as a creator, are the copyright holder and owner. So mm -hmm. it, isn't until, it isn't until you sign a piece of paper that says, I relinquish those rights, that you lose them. So there are, we're kind of, and when I started with Bradford, they just assumed they were going to get all the rights. But I said, no, how about this? You guys only do certain things. Well, because they, they wanted to protect the image from showing up on other porcelain or other plates. So we limited, mm -hmm. we limited to those uses, but all the other things were on the table. So that's why it was, it was to my benefit to be able to take those things into other products and categories. Uh, I could use the same work for multiple of reasons. But that's a good question because I don't think a lot of people understand that uh, as an artist, you have, you have God-given rights. <laughs> And you sometimes you have, to fight, you have to fight for them to keep them, but they're yours. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. This also is a limited edition print. Uh, this was a lot of fun because I, I decided I wanted to do, I read the, uh, um, not the, yeah, the Sword and the Stone and really loved it. I thought it'd be fun to do something based on Merlin and Arthur as a subject. Uh, but what I also thought would be interesting is as I, the more research I did about Merlin, the more I realized there were all these different legends about him that um, they were, if you put them all together, they didn't all make sense, but they were different, different cultures and uh, particularly in England and Ireland and Scotland, they had taken Merlin as their own and uh, incorporated him into their legends. So I decided what if I could use a lot of these things in the magician's laboratory as symbols for parts of the legend. So in the lower right-hand corner, if you can see that there's a puffin. And in Ireland, they believe that when Arthur died, he, his soul became a puffin, uh, or he's reincarnated as a puffin. Over an extreme left on, that, on the surface of that dresser there is a small model of Stonehenge. And it, it's believed, it was believed that Arthur uh, Merlin placed those stones in position because it's always been a mystery. And they thought, well, it must have been some magician as mighty as Merlin that put them there. So that's there. And then if you had the time and could look over the whole piece, you'd find about 24 more examples of uh, legends from Arthur and, and also Merlin. Scott, if I may, a good question for uh, that slide. Somebody asked, where do you get the costumes that your characters wear? This one, that um, Merlin was wearing an old choir robe. <laughs> and then I, I just adapted that and tried to make it look like a wizard's robe. I have a, one of those caps. I can't remember what they're called right now. Those uh, medieval um, caps, skull caps. So that I had. Um, and the neighbor boy posed in, a, I think, an oversized 
t-shirt. Um, so it's just kind of, I do have some, some actual period costumes that I've gotten over the years and I've tried to buy general types of things that could be reused. So general types of medieval things, general types of Victorian things. Um, and sometimes I'm lucky enough that those things actually work, but a lot of times it's just doing research, finding some modern facsimile that will work as a stand-in and then adapting that in the drawing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't mind, another question we have. Somebody asked, how much time do you spend planning the composition for your artworks? And do you use the rule of thirds or any other compositional rules? I don't really have any compositional rules. Um, it just depends on, on the, the picture and the situation, uh, the space that I have to work in. That's, that's a very real uh, restriction when you're working on illustrations. You have to know the dimensions of the page you're working on. If you're gonna go a full page, two double pages like this would be, or are you gonna do a vignette, a smaller piece? So that's, I think a lot of people who are just starting don't realize that that is a restriction. You can't just work to whatever size your heart would like to use. You have to stick to the dimensions of the physical book. Um, but I don't have any hard and fast rules. I do a lot of thumbnail sketches and then refine it as I move along and then I'll show if it's a client-based thing, then I'll eventually show those sketches to the client. But when I'm doing my own work, I just do variations, pick the one I like best, and then start from there or proceed. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. I've also had the opportunity to work for Celestial Seasonings. Um, this is um, a job I did for them. And this one actually made... That. Thank you. Made it onto the tea box. I did uh, one piece that ended up not being used, but they were a client that they were fun to work for, but they wanted, they wanted a lot of choices. This was one of the first sketches I did for them, but I think I did an additional maybe 10, eight or 10 before they circled back around and said, you know what, maybe we'll do that panda app. So uh, mm. it, it tries your patience and your creativity sometimes, but uh, it does give you a chance to try more than one approach. Then I decided that I'd been wanting to do, uh, write my own story and illustrate it. And I was always open to the possibilities of that. And it just so happened that I was rereading some Poe stories that I had re uh, read when I was, pardon me, in eighth grade. And I had the same book that I had, the same paperback, and I started remembering what I was like when I was 14 and reading it the first time. And then I started thinking, I wonder what Edgar Allan Poe was like when he was that age. And one thing led to another. I started researching him as a, as a person and uh, especially that point in his life. And this story grew out of that, where it's basically, he is kind of uh, the center between his, well, Poe wrote a story, a short story called The Imp of the Perverse, which was this voice inside the character's head that's telling him to do weird and things that are not good for him. So I kind of turned that into a character. His name is Macabre. And he basically sits on uh, Eddie's shoulder. And in the other side, he's on the other side, he has this pet raven who uh, is kind of the voice of reason and is offering him better advice. And Eddie's torn, torn between the two. Uh, and so there's a, a little adventure that takes place kind of on that premise. This was all in black and white in pencil. I'm more comfortable in pencil than pen and ink these days. So we, I'd do them, we'd shoot them, and then we would, after they were scanned, my wife would beef up the black so that it really looked rich and black. These probably are more black than the pencil drawings were. Then I've also done private commissions. There was a man who was, uh, he's actually working on a book, a dragon book, but he, um, he said, how would you like to do a, a dragon piece for me? The only stipulation I have is that it has three young women in it and at least one husky dog. So I thought, well, that, that's a good open playing field. So I came up with this, which I call a confabulation of dragons. Like, 
I wanted to do a group of dragons. The idea was that they're meeting in a forest glade or somewhere. And uh, I thought, well, what would you call a meeting of dragons like that? And I had to be looking in the dictionary and came across the word confabulation, and that seemed to fit just right. So, <laughs> and also, uh, small, uh, I mean, kind of ironic that one of the more recent things I've been working on, I've revisited some of the Alice characters. So this is uh, my more recent take on the Mad Hatter and the March Hare. When I did the painting that's in the show, those were primary, I was thinking in terms of kids' books and trying to make Alice in Wonderland appropriate for little kids uh, in the 20th century, as it turns out. Well, now I'm looking at it as an adult and rereading it and thinking these characters are pretty wacky. And uh, I'm just gonna do them kind of imbuing them with some of the madness that is actually in them as characters and how Alice sees them as not, you know, there's, it's all playing with logic and uh, manipulating the rules and driving Alice a little nutty in the process. So anyway, I thought it was more, I had a little more fun uh, revisiting those characters and I've ended up uh, doing more than, uh, doing more than just those two. Here's a group that I just finished. So this is actually bringing us right up to date with uh, some of my most recent work. I don't know if you had any more questions. I need a drink, so. <laughs> oh, yeah, we have another question. Uh, somebody asked, do you draw inspiration from non-art non sources other than film, existing art, books, et cetera? Um, well, non-art, well, yeah, I think all the time, you know, uh, walking the dog or, uh, taking a walk or seeing the way light hurt, hits a certain thing. There's always things that mostly it's like, wow, that would make a great painting someday if I could work that in. And sometimes I'll make a note of that. And but most of the time they kind of slip away and you hope that you can retrieve it. I also have, whenever we've taken vacations, much to the you know, uh, annoyance of my family, I've always taken pictures. So when we visit a, historical site, I'm crawling around taking pictures of the, you know, the woodwork and stuff like that. And uh, I've got a big file of those types of things. And then I pull those out when uh, I think they might be, I may be able to use them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Was there um, anything else that you wanted to show? Well, I have, uh, I don't, how much more time do we have? Oh, don't worry about it. Oh, okay. Well, I've got a step by step on. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I can go on to that if you'd like to proceed with that. So this is a painting. This is, a, we're going to go from the basic idea all the way through to the end. Uh, this, is, this is on our website. So if, if you miss something here, uh, you can visit our website and kind of refresh uh, what I go through more quickly here. But one year I do a family Christmas card every year. This was a pencil drawing I called Santa's treat. And he's offering the apples to the reindeer and they're also licking him. So I thought someday I'd like to make a painting out of this. So I revisited it and started sketching. And I kind of like reworking the, the composition partly because I realized that I had made Santa Claus in this. He's way too short. Reindeer aren't that tall. So I wanted to put him in a better position proportionately to them. And I like this. I, he's literally uh, the top of the, you know, the highest part of the composition. I think your eye goes to him. So I started from there. Th th that's what's called a thumbnail or a rough sketch. I hmm. also, because I wanted to check on the, the anatomy and how I was doing, uh, I had, I posed myself, our son took these pictures of me and uh, that gives you an idea of what my reference photos look like. Um, and then that's a rough drawing, kind of incorporating. I like to take a lot of pictures and I mount them on pieces of cardboard. You know, I have them printed at the local photo or uh, yeah, photo store or the drugstore. And I tape them, select the ones that I like, 
that I think I can use. And then I paste them up next to each other so I can cross reference. And I do that because I never get what I want in a single shot. I always have to combine a hand from this shot, an arm, you know, whatever. It's just bits and pieces. So then I can kind of pull all those together and make a single draw. So from there, I start refining the whole thing. And what I'm doing is the, so the, the gray, the Santa Claus in the background, that's pencil drawing, but I've also drawn the reindeer on separate pieces of paper and Xerox them. And I'll move those around. It's basically like pasting up when you're working digitally. Uh, yeah, did you have a question? Oh, okay. Um, so I'll, that way it saves me time. If I draw the character the way I like him, I can keep moving him around and get a feel for the design as opposed to, wow, I wish you were an inch lower and then have to redraw him. So I also had, back when I did the night before Christmas, I sculpted uh, this sculpture of the reindeer. And I have referred to that a lot over the years as reference for how, how you look, how a reindeer looks from different angles. So that I have done quite a bit of sculpture over the years as reference and a lot of it, the stuff that has been the best used has always been worth the effort of uh, having, having done it. So this is what that sketch looked like with the crop and working within the size that I decided. Now I was doing this painting just because I thought I wanted to do a Santa Claus painting. Uh, these days, we'll, I'll usually do a new Christmas piece and then we'll have it as a card. So, but these are a little more elaborate than the old ones used to be. Now here is an example mm -hmm. of the drawing board while I'm working. That little guy sitting there is a GI Joe. <laughs> uh, but I, I uh, incorporated him in this because I needed someone to show what I was doing. I couldn't do that, but I needed to take the photo. I need to fo photograph someone, take the photographs and be in the photographs at the same time. So I had Joe stand in for me. Uh, this is an example of all the stuff. I don't usually have this much stuff on the drawing board, but this kind of shows you that I've got, I've got an iPad up there in the upper left-hand corner. The, uh, the Xeroxes of the characters are spread out. They're different sizes. So I try keep, I cut them out and, and keep moving them around. There's the reindeer over on the right, that drawing, I ended up not using that particular drawing, but that's an example of being able to have one that I tried, didn't work right, so I did another one. Um, anyway, the, and, and Joe is actually sitting on a pile of stuff that forms the foundation. There's photographs, there are books, reference books, and there are CDs and coffee. All that stuff goes into a picture. Uh, oh, and there over on the left, you can barely see that reindeer sculpture that I had done that I mentioned for the night before Christmas. So this is how the, the table looks. I have what's called a, a hot wax. Um, that was a standard a uh, piece of equipment in old commercial art studios back in the day. And it basically is a small tabletop thing, probably about the size, well, it's hard to say how big, it's about a foot and a half by uh, a foot. It covers up a uh, you know, table. But anyway, it, you turn it on, it heats up this wax that uh, is a tacky wax and that once it's hot, you can put a drawing through it or actually Xerox. You don't really want to put original drawings through it, but it puts a thin coating of wax on the back side. And that makes it so that I can move those things around on the surface of the sketch without committing that thing. I don't have to glue it down. It just stays there. It's tacky. And I can pull it up, pull it up at any time. And when I finally decide, okay, it's, it's there to stay, I burnish it down and it's, it's not permanent, but it stays there long enough for my purposes. So this is the finished drawing after I got done with all the elements and got it all together. Now I, sometimes I'll take this and I'll transfer it directly onto masonite or canvas using graphite paper. And you'll put that between the surface of the copy and then 
trace over it. So it's like, uh, it's like carbon paper. But in this case, I decided I wanted to try having it printed out on canvas. I know a guy here in Chicago that does that. So he printed it out on a piece of canvas, which I'll get to later. But also I do a color study. So I'll take and that same image and reduce it to a very, just a small size. This is probably about four by five. And I'll put it, Xerox it or print it onto a piece of kind of like watercolor paper. And then I'll stretch that. So you soak it in water, stretch it on a, a drawing board and then tape it down. And then when it dries, it's nice and flat and you can work wet on top of it and it won't curl up. You know how a loose piece of paper, if you spill water on it, it just curls right up. Well, this stays that way. The trouble is that the paper tape that I have used and I've been only paper tape that I can find, sometimes releases, the adhesive doesn't hold the paper well enough so that as it dries, it starts to shrink, the paper does. And then the tape isn't strong enough to hold it and the, the drawing will slip out from underneath. So as it starts to dry, I retape it with masking tape to make sure that it stays flat and doesn't shrink. And then all, once that's done, then I'll put a coat of gesso and water on it because I want to knock that black back. I don't want it to be that black when I start painting on it. I want it kind of gray, but I want to use all the information that I put into my drawing. And I want to use that as much as possible without redrawing it. So that's what the color study looked like when it was done. This was a this one went really fast for me. It only took a couple of hours, but I knew. I was pretty sure what the colors were going to be before I started. That's not always the case. Sometimes I have to do more than one. So, but this one moved right along. It's it, like you saw, it wasn't very big. This is an acrylic. And I don't worry about making a finished painting. This is only a guide for the painting that's coming later. And I might even change some of these colors. But this is a starting point. I didn't used to do this when I first started. Uh, but now that I, I do it, I can't imagine not doing it for a full scale painting because it just saves you so much time and effort. If I had decided, if I painted that background, uh, you know, a different blue and then decided I didn't like that, I would have to repaint it. But I can make that decision on a small scale and then go ahead with the painting. So this is just, mm -hmm. Joe is showing us how we mount the, uh, that canvas onto a piece of masonite. Now, this is the back, but I do the same thing on the front. So I coat the piece of sheet of masonite with uh, some gel medium, matte medium, and then I put the, the Xerox or the copy on, face up on top of that. And this tool is a paper hanging, wallpaper hanging tool. And you use it to squeegee out bubbles and excess liquid paste. And I squeegee that out, get it nice and flat, let it dry. And then the next day I come up and I, well, I start, uh, it's a nice surface, it's nice and flat. But I also put a coat of gel medium on top of that. That protects that image. Uh, from the oil paint, because I'm going to be rubbing and scrubbing on top of it. And it also gives the oil paint a, ni a really nice base to work on. And the, the, uh, it's kind of like a clear gesso. I really like that surface. And I like using a roller. It gives you kind of a nice eggshell finish. So this is the stretch canvas. I'm ready to start painting. And that's the uh, called the Imprimatura. I've taken some uh, raw sienna for the warm color and a little ultramarine and dioxanine purple for the back. And this is just a wash. I just want to give myself general colors to work on top of. I've found that working a little warmer than blue, if you're going to go blue on a background, it's kind of nice to start with something warm because if you start blue, it just stays really cold. And I like having an interplay between the warm and the cold. This is, uh, now I'm starting with the oil paint. This is the next day. I'm starting to fine tune. You can see I light the sky. I've added red and brown. 
Um, but I'm still, I kind of keep my colors limited at this point. Now I'm Joe's helping out, but I'm starting <laughs> to, uh, to think more in terms of establishing my main character. And now I, I like to, once I've kind of gotten a general idea, I like to go in and work on the background and then work forward. Because for me, I like the characters to work in the background as opposed to trying to make a background work around my characters. So this is the next stage. This is, uh, I'm working on his, uh, his coat, defining that. Also in the middle of this, this happened to be, I happened to be painting a Santa Claus picture at Christmas time. So there was a, a garden shop out in the suburbs that had a reindeer, a live reindeer. My wife had told me about it for years. Finally, this year I went out and photographed it. That was a great use of my half day because uh, anytime you can see the real thing, it just helps bring more knowledge to what you're doing. And the richness of a reindeer's coat, the way they're put together, uh, was just really enlightening and really fascinating. So I went back to work with renewed inspiration for painting reindeer. This is, a, I'm working on Santa Claus's face. Faces are more, the more complicated thing. It's one of the more complicated things. So if I can nail down the face early on, then I'll be more comfortable with the rest of the picture. So here's a, in the inset, you can see Santa's face is pretty well done. That reindeer that's licking him is getting closer to being done, but then the, the lower one, that's, that's how he looks in his unfinished form. So now we're moving mm -hmm. along and the one on the right is now looking more, more uh, finished. And here he is pretty much finished. And you'll notice that I changed the color of the halter. I decided I was gonna have each one have a distinctive color, but I thought that making them all green would help them tie them together, and also it harmonized or it, it worked as a counterpoint to the red of Santa Claus's suit. And here things are progressing, working on the reindeer. The one in the foreground now is getting finished. Uh, this, this is kind of, it's hard to see the difference from day to day. You can tell primarily that the apples weren't done, now they're done. Uh, at this point, uh, I'm almost finished. And I like to take an inventory and assess where I am and what I think I need to do to the piece to really finish it off. And so I'll make a list because I, sometimes there's just too much stuff to remember and I'll think I'm done and come back the next day and go, oh man, I, that's right, I was gonna do, I was gonna make his eye a little more twinkly or something. So I like to make that list and then check things off as, a, as I go. And I think this, even though it's a very subtle period, of a painting, it helps pull everything together. It gives me a chance to kind of make sure that I can get as much harmony in a piece as possible. Joe hates this day because there's nothing to, for him to do. Uh, but so he just sits and plays his guitar. But also there, there's something that happens as a piece dries. Sometimes even with oil paint, even though they're, they're basically very consistent from wet to drying, Sometimes the darker areas will do what's called sinking. And you have to varnish those to bring that color back. To it. Now it's really hard to see the difference between these two. But if you look in the darkest areas of the basket, you'll see there's kind of a blue gray. And that was what I needed to fix. So on the right side is it's varnished and you can see that the colors are a little more rich. And varnish in general just helps bring oil paints to their best possible. So this is the final painting. Uh, Joe and I deserve a rest after this. <laughs> he's, taking his on the, he's taking his on the easel. I take mine downstairs, but uh, anyway. So that was a wonderful overview, Scott, of um, your process. Thank you so much for sharing that. It's really enlightening. Um, it, it sounds like you have not ventured into the digital, but I wondered if you had tried it out. It's so, I mean, I've been seeing the original paintings have this incredible object quality and it's it's really um, in, in many ways can't be replaced, but I was wondering if you had ventured into the digital at all. I think if I had started, uh, if I were starting now, I definitely would be working digitally but because I started and I learned to paint traditionally and I love painting so much that it, and over the years we would watch working illustrators, uh, we in the art business would watch 
keep our eye on the digital field and think, ah, they're not there yet. We don't have to worry about those guys. <laughs> because in, in the beginning, they could do circles and they could do cubes, they could do uh, balls, but it was very basic and simple. And so I wasn't, I wasn't paying attention and I wasn't learning as it progressed. And now I'm so far behind that I would have to spend so much time trying to catch up that I've just decided to, we do, my wife is, and my son are the technical wizards here in the family. My wife does a lot of, of the online and technical stuff for me. But as far as the actual creation of the work, I stick to traditionally. So that's a long way of saying, no, I haven't worked with you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Anybody in our room or online? Okay. Well, I want to thank you so much for um, this incredible presentation. And um, we're so happy it'll be online for future reference, but your work is just extraordinary. And we're really enjoying having it on view uh, in the original form in our galleries right now. Thank you so thank much, Scott. Thank you. And I thank you for having me. And thanks to everybody that participated and asked questions. They were great questions. So thank I just want to also say thank you, Scott, for having such thoughtful answers and explaining everything so thoroughly. I also want to say thank you to all the guests. There's about 750 people watching across our platforms gathered here tonight. And as we wrap up, I'd just like to say uh, this recording will be available on both our YouTube and the museum's website um, on Thursday to be watched. And I'd like to invite you all to consider coming to our next programs. Uh, next week on August 3rd, we'll be talking to Anna Dittman. And then in another week on August 10th, we'll be talking with Bob Eggleton. Um, on August 7th, we'll be having our outdoor art workshop with Ruth Sanderson, The Magic of Trees, Plain Air, from 1 to 4 p.m. Um, on We'll be having our third annual Art of the Brewing Festival on Saturday, August 21st, from 1 to 4 p.m. And feel free to register for Raiders of the Lost Ark 40th anniversary screening, which will be on August 25th from 6.30 to 10.30 p.m. Also, every week we have that Norman Rockwell Museum podcast. Uh, next week, we'll have the new episode, Etienne de Lazert on uh, nrm.org slash podcast. Our new exhi uh, exhibitions to see here at Stockbridge are virtually, we have the Enchanted a History of Fantasy illustration, which will be on view through October 31st. And you can also see our Land of Enchantment Fantastical Features outdoor exhibit on view through October 31st as well. Finally, thank you all for joining us. Uh, joining us, we invite you to become a part of the community in a stronger way by becoming a member or making a small gift to uh, support this work on nrm.org slash support. Thank you, Drew, and thank you, everybody, for coming. Have a great evening. To check out more of Scott's work, feel free to visit his website at scottgustafson.com. Thank you. <laughs>